listening to this right now i hope it is a good one and i want to say thank you for joining us for another episode of on the pipe podcast i'm your host as always tyler shepherdson and more specifically you are listening to the latest and probably not greatest but definitely the latest and it might be the greatest we got some good guests coming at you edition of otp tuesday where we recap everything that happened over the weekend the racers podcast to get your fill and knowledge and know-how and speak with some riders that we have coming at you tonight we got a good show for you we have xc2 winner from the wild board gncc trail jesters ktms johnny gerard grabs his first career xc2 victory over the weekend and we sit down and talk with him about that We'll also be talking to another XC2 title contender. He's one of the favorites heading into the season, and he is also Rockstar Energy Husqvarna's newest rider in the rig under the tent. Craig DeLong is going to sit down and speak with us a little bit about his deal and how his race went. And then we're also going to be talking with Team Green, Babbitts Online, Monster Energy, Kawasaki's Jordan Ashburn. He's been on a tear lately as well, running up in the front. So we're going to talk with him and see how everything is going with him as well. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode that we have coming at you. We're also going to go over some of the other storylines and some things that happened from the weekend. I apologize if I'm a little nasally and a little stuffy. This is my first ever episode talking with coronavirus. I'm just kidding. I don't think I have coronavirus, but I have something going on. So... Excuse me for the nasally sound, and if I sniffle or clear my throat throughout this thing, just know, for one, I'm sorry, and for two, it cannot be transmitted through your speakers, and I really just think it's allergies. I think it's allergies. I cut my lawn yesterday. It's springtime. Spring is sprung. I think it's my allergies, but nevertheless, you can't catch it through the microphone. You're just going to have to deal with a little bit of annoyance in the way that I sound, so... Thank you for bearing with me, and thank you for tuning in once again. Before we get anything started, this is a tough subject, and I I never know how to approach these situations, and there's never the right words. There's never the right way to put it into perspective, but unfortunately for the second weekend in a row, racing in off-road and more specifically here in the Carolinas we have lost a rider in a race in the action over the weekend the North Carolina Hair Scramble Association or NCHSA they were racing over the weekend not too far down the road from here in Connolly Springs North Carolina at um, at Lost Valley Motorsports Park It's been a property that's been raced on for several years now. It is under new ownership and a different name. It used to be called Rock House. But nevertheless, North Carolina opened up their series there yesterday. And with a very unfortunate and very tragic accident, we actually saw the passing of Sam Marty. Now, Sam Marty is from... The New England area, he's from up north, and um, he was at the North Carolina race because he is stationed in North Carolina. He is an active member of the United States Air Force, and so he has raced some North Carolina races in the past, and he was out there once again this weekend just doing what he loved, trying to get a break from the day-to-day life to come out and race dirt bikes with everybody, so... 
it's a very sad situation, especially, and I don't want to say especially coming the second week in a row of losing a rider because every time that this happens, it, it never gets any easier. It never gets any better. There, there will never be the right words to say. There will never be the right feelings to feel. Um, it's just a bummer. It's it, it's a it's a real bummer. This one hit me a little bit harder than normal. Um, Sam was 27 years old. I myself am 27 years old. Sam was an active member of the United States military. So first and foremost, I want to thank him for his service. And anybody listening, I want to thank you for your service as well. Um, that that's really important to me. But just thinking about, it, I mean, and. Anything that I say, I don't want it to be misconstrued. I don't want it to come off one way or the other. But there's been several riders that have passed away from health events, um, which a lot of times we aren't really thinking about that as racers, especially if we're doing the proper training and, and staying in shape. And even us like on the younger side, something health-related isn't really something that's on – your radar going into a race um but unfortunately this happened due to an accident on the track and i think what really makes it hit home even more is that it happened on the motocross track which was out in in a high spectator area so from what i understand a lot of people saw it and a lot of people saw the aftermath of it and i this one just it it hits hard and last year at the Mid East Hair Scrambles, we lost Mike Rice as well. Um, so once again, rest in peace to him. That one hit me hard as well. I was actually in the race that he was racing, and um, where he he suffered an accident and ended up succumbing of his injuries as well. But it's just, it's really sad to see. It, it's really hard to think about. It, it's hard to think about the fact that. This was just a, a young guy out there just trying to have fun, trying to come out and make some memories and hang out with some buddies and race some dirt bikes. And there's no part of any of us that show up to a race in the morning thinking that we're not going to go home that night. And the fact with it being a injury inflicted thing off of a crash, that's something that could happen to anybody at any time. You can't, you can't prepare for that. That's why it's called an accident. You can't prepare for those things you can go out there and and ride to your ability and ride the best that you can but sometimes they're unavoidable and I don't want to ramble about it because I didn't know Sam personally and I don't want to step on anybody's toes and I don't want to say any of the wrong things I just it it hit me personally and just like they all do every time we lose someone in this sport it's it's never easy and um, I just wanted to, to start out by by saying that because it, it doesn't only affect him; it affects his family. I mean, he was he was someone's son. He he was someone's friend. Um, it affects the landowners. I mean, the landowners has to deal with that for one, but also have that on their conscience. And same thing with the race promoters; that's going to be heavy on their conscience as well. And then every spectator that that was there. Every race competitor that was there. I mean, something like this just affects so many people, and I am I really hate to see it. It really kind of bums me out, and I don't mean to start this thing off on a negative note, but it's just something that, that I wanted to talk about and say rest in peace to Sam Marty, and once again, thank him for his service. So just take a moment here for him. But, yeah, um, as I mentioned, we've got a good show coming at you guys. We have a lot going on. Uh, we got several guests lined up. I'm hoping that it's going to be a good episode. I'm hoping that you guys enjoy these episodes. I try to get, uh, I've had a lot of the pros on and a lot of pretty big names on, and it's not always going to be like that. I also want to talk to some more amateur riders. We had Brody Johnson on, who has been top amateur two rounds in a row now. 
We had Josh Guffey on when he hit that tree. So it, it's really people that have stories. Uh, those are the people I want to talk to and maybe someone that you don't hear from regularly. So my goal here is to try to keep it entertaining for you all and keep new content coming at you and just kind of see some different perspectives from all sorts of different folks that are in some way related to the racing world. So I hope you guys are enjoying these episodes. If you are enjoying them, I pretty short of beg you to go ahead and and subscribe if you're listening to this on a podcast platform just go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I, I feel weird saying that but it helps me out a lot and it'll keep you guys up to date with what's going on also we're pushing everything to youtube now so if you don't want to listen to a podcast app or maybe you're sitting at work on your computer you can go to YouTube and find all of our episodes on there now. I don't plan to monetize any of that, so there won't be any ads. You should be able to listen straight through to them. You can look us up on YouTube at On The Pipe Podcast. If you just type in On The Pipe Podcast, all the shows will come up. So I'll be putting them there going forward. Also, what was I going to say? If you want to follow us on Instagram, we're at On The Pipe Podcast. also got a Facebook page, all sorts of stuff. So... If you don't mind and you do enjoy these episodes, subscribe to them and also share them. I mean, uh, that right now I'm kind of in the in the building phase and I'm really trying my hardest to put everything into it. Like I said, tonight it's already 9.30 at night right now on Tuesday, but I'm still working hard to get this episode out because you guys expect an episode every Tuesday now. And it is my mission to deliver on those expectations and keep a show coming out. Regardless of if I'm sick or what was going on at work or any, anything like that. We all love dirt bikes and that's what we want to talk about. And so I'm going to quit rambling about all this. But tell a friend, share the posts when they come out. Give me some feedback. Let me know what you like and what you don't like. And we will go from there. But with that being said, we got a lot, lot, lot to talk about. And a lot of really good guests coming at you. So we're going to go and talk now with this past weekend's XC2 Pro winner, the Trail Jesters KTM of Johnny G, Johnny Gerrar. How's it going tonight, Johnny? It's going good. How are you? Pretty good, man. I mean, first and foremost, like I said, thanks for taking the time out to talk with us. And also, congratulations on, on getting the win this past weekend. I know it's been a long road for you to get back to this step and, and come away with a victory here at round number two. How does that feel? It feels good. You know, definitely had a long road and... A lot of uh, roadblocks and a lot of stuff trying to uh, stop me and hold me down. But, uh, you know, I just kept fighting and never um, lost sight of, you know, what I wanted to do and what I want to be. And uh, it feels good to be back and on the top stop. Man, I can imagine so. And I know there's a lot that that went into it, but, I mean, kind of briefly or, or as in-depth as you want to go, really, can you kind of walk us through everything that happened last year? I mean, it's been mentioned on the broadcast about the health scare, and I know a lot of people are kind of unsure with the details of it all. So, I mean, what did you go through last year? Yeah, so basically um, I was born with four airways in my right lung, and um, you're only supposed to have three, and – one of them, um, the extra one closed off and it stopped working properly. And, um, so that's where the infection started from. And when I went to Indiana, um, they freaked out and thought I had lymphoma cancer, a tumor in my right lung, which, um, it wasn't, it was actually a seven centimeter lung infection and it was wrapped around my esophagus and stuff. But, um, so they told me that, and I thought I had cancer for two weeks. And um, so it was just cool to um, not have cancer, obviously, <laughs> and um, be able to get fixed and, and be back riding a motorcycle. And I know I spent about 30 days in the hospital, and then I spent, you know, a while, I mean, months after that recovering and just trying to gain strength to walk around and uh, just live every day. Dude, that's insane. I can't even begin to imagine the thought of being told something like that and then kind of not knowing. But turns out it, it wasn't cancer. So what, what brought all that up? I mean, were you having shortness of breath? Or, I mean, what made you realize that something was going on? 
Well, I raced Steel Creek, and I got second there. And then I went home, and uh, me and my girlfriend went to Walmart um, Monday at, like, noon, and I came home and just started feeling like I was getting sick, hot and sweat, hot, cold, hot, cold sweats and throwing up and stuff. And I was like, I got the flu, so I got to sleep this off. So I went to bed and woke up about 2.30 in the morning and felt like someone was stabbing me with a knife in my right lung. And um, what happened was it all swelled up. It was touching all my organs. And every time my heart beat, it felt like someone was stabbing me with a knife. And I, like, had real shortage of breath. So I woke up about 2.30 in the morning and said, I got to go to the hospital now. So that's where it all started. Man, that's that's crazy. So to resolve that, was it kind of like antibiotics until it went away? Or did you have surgery? Um, Yeah, I had a surgery. In Indiana, and then, yeah, it was just all medicine and antibiotics and just full of everything you can imagine. Dang. Well, I'm glad you made it through that. Glad it wasn't cancer. I'll get off that topic now because I know that's in your past. Now we're looking forward, winning races, doing well here in XC2, on the podium both rounds, top 10 overall both rounds. How long has it been since you've been back on the bike and, and training hard and really preparing for the 2020 season? Um, well, honestly, only a couple months. Like, I started training serious when I got down to Josh's and stuff. But other than that, I mean, I was up north riding around a little bit with my buddies and stuff, but still, like, weak as breathing goes and stuff and still just couldn't um, find the wind strength I guess you should say to really pedal hard and and do motos and stuff I felt like I was running out of breath really short and fast and worked with Steve and Denise and went up there for a couple days at a time and just didn't feel awesome so um I would think just probably like a couple months and um I haven't raced the GNCCs in 10 to 11 months since big bucks so to get second and then follow up with a win I mean that's more than I could ask for Thanks. So two races down, six hours of racing down. How's your how's your training, or not your training, but how's your your lungs and your breathing and your physical condition now? How does everything feel? I feel good. I feel good. Um, my my wind strength is, um, I would say, back to one hundred percent. I mean, I don't have any issues with it, and it feels good. And um, I felt strong in Florida, and um, I knew I had to get away from Mike there because um, I had to pit twice so I didn't want him to get back by me and I I gapped him and um, you know just cruised it in the last lap I know he reeled me back in a little bit but I felt good and um, you know I feel like uh, it's going to be a good year yeah and I think that everybody can say that after the, the two performances you've put on already but You've been down there training at Ranch Russell, staying with Caleb and, and training down there with those guys. And, I mean, obviously you're no stranger to, to sand being from Southwick, Mass. How much how much of this round was being used to riding in the sand and being comfortable in it? And, and how much of it was training over at Ranch Russell? Like, how, how beneficial is that being around those guys? It was definitely a huge help. You know, I feel, I feel like I'm in good shape. I'm not in my best shape for no matter I mean I'm definitely going to get stronger as more races come and the year goes on but just being in the sand like that and and Caleb's track I would say is harder than the race for sure so um just being used to pounding sand whoops and and floating in the sand I mean I think it was huge yeah uh, absolutely I mean you went out there you had the fastest lap time in XC2 and uh, like you said, I think you were fourth coming in off the first lap and then reeled those guys in and were able to, to distance yourself from second place throughout the race and, and able to get that win there that you mentioned. So, I mean, coming in strong at Big Buck, first race back on the bike, second place there, and then second round, you already got a win under your belt. I think you've definitely some, or put yourself in the title picture for XC2, what was your goals going into 2020? And I mean, now how high up on that priority list is chasing this championship? Well, to be honest with you, I, um, I, my goal right away was to win the championship this year. And, um, goals coming in the first couple rounds, I just wanted to get on the podium, even if it was 
you know, in the top three spot. And, um, and now that it's actually happening and I got a win under my belt, like, obviously it's, <laughs> um, definitely a higher thought, but you know, I never, never really doubted myself and I knew, um, a new hard work pays off and, and, um, I was ready to race. Man, that, this is such an awesome story and so awesome to see you coming out and getting those results, especially having that mentality and that mindset going into the season. Um, mentioned training, or you were with Josh Toth for a while, then down at Ranch Russell for a while. You're back at, at Josh's house now up in North Carolina. Where, what's the rest of your season look like? Like, Where are you going to be training at? Where are you going to be riding? I mean, what's your plans for for practicing and training? I'll just be um, hanging out here in North Carolina and uh, riding with Josh as he gets better and he'll be back on the bike soon and um, just hanging out down here and and riding uh, around here training and um, probably just travel to the races from here. This is going to be home base. Good deal. Glad to hear. And I mean, it's such a convenient area to be in really because you're right in the middle of them all. I mean, there's there's no races that are that far away besides Ironman and maybe when you get up close to New York, but, uh, yeah, man, uh, definitely looking forward to how the rest of the season goes for you. And I got to ask, we were there for the, for the first podium at snowshoe. And I mean, you were as as pumped as pumped could be. What was the, what were the emotions like? What was it like the night of big buck? Like, how did you celebrate? How happy were you to get that win? I meant Florida, not big buck. Uh, it was it was unbelievable. Um, I just it just brought a lot of emotion to me, and uh, just thinking about my dad and how happy he'd be, and and um, what his dreams were, and how you know I'm kind of living his dreams, and uh, it definitely got emotional for me. I was very excited, and um, you know it was just huge monkey off my back, and I don't know, it just felt felt great. Like everything I've ever worked for, like just finally came through it was it was an amazing feeling for sure man awesome to hear that and like i said awesome story man glad you're back healthy and already back up at the front and running up front in these xc2 races and i know you haven't done this whole thing alone johnny who are the people that you'd like to thank that's helped you out along the way yeah for sure um trail justice um the whole ktm team my mechanic woody my motor man george suspension guy tom i uh, live extreme steve hatch for helping me um through it all um, steven squires helped me a bunch too like to thank him cd reva hammer nutrition seat concepts usw waterbacks specialized Troy designs fmf loud fuel Renthal, dunlop xc gear 100 uh, percent p3 carbon edelman sales squid decals z arch auto um cherry beast and uh my girlfriend, all my family, friends, everyone, the fans, um, especially a big shout out to Ross. I mean, if it wasn't for him, none of this would be possible. So it's awesome. Dang, man. That's awesome. Sounds like you got that sponsor list down pat and, uh, something tells me you'll be having to say it a lot more times this year up on podiums. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, man, congratulations once again. We'll see you this weekend in Georgia, and good luck this weekend and and throughout the rest of your season. All right, thank you. So there was Johnny G coming fresh off of an XC2 victory. We saw him ending up on the podium at round number one as well in the second place position, which that was the first time I really heard in depth about his medical issues and medical stuff that he went through, so... It's, it's quite remarkable what he's been able to do since coming back from that and coming up and really not losing any steam at all as he proves that he is a solid contender for that title running up front at both of the first two rounds of the season. So no doubt with the mentality and the drive to get over something like that, Johnny will be a force to be reckoned with throughout the rest of the season. But speaking of wild boar gncc where he got his first pro win there was also a lot of other stuff that happened out at that race but first i want to get back into the north carolina series they are the local series that ran here this past weekend we mentioned them 
with the uh, with the stuff at the beginning. We had a couple big names show up at the NCHSA, but taking home first place was Blake Grindstaff getting the pro overall win. Robbie Norwood, your second place finisher and former NCHSA champ, Garrett Duncan will take home third place and the final overall podium spot at the NCHSA. So, want to throw that in there real quick before we get into our wild boar GNCC results. A lot of stuff going on down there in the sands of Florida, but it was Caleb Russell taking the win and the overall victory. Well, that's pretty much the same exact thing. So, anyway, he was the fastest one there. That That's basically what I'm trying to say, which the f- Last time Caleb won back to back opening rounds so around number one and two, I believe, was 2015. So Caleb Russell coming out swinging. He himself will say that Florida is not normally his best track, but he made it his best track over the weekend as he grabs the overall win to start his season 1 1 and retains that white plate. Because they're flipped in off-road. So we'll see the white plate with the big red number ones. And I'm sure Caleb is on a mission to make sure that he does not change that number plate color for the rest of the season. Grabbing second place on the Babbitts Online Monster Energy Kawasaki was Josh Strang. So he follows up his performance last week with a podium in that third place spot to this week. Moving up a step into that second place position. So awesome for him. And then we got Ricky Russell who swapped places with Josh Strang from Big Buck. They finished two and three there. Here they finished three and two. So Ricky Russell on the Coastal Racing Husqvarna will round out your pro overall podium. But he did not do it easily. There was a lot of battling and a lot of stuff going on out there. But Ricky Russell would eventually... End up in that third place spot, nudging out Jordan Ashburn and I believe it was Todd Kellett. So Todd Kellett, we'll get to him in a second here, but a guy coming over from the UK racing his first GNCC ends up sixth place in the race, and or sixth place in XC1, 10th place overall, so... Coming to the roughest GNCC that there is, most likely, as a lot of people would agree with, that's impressive results for him to to come over and uh, put himself up that far in the finishing order. But like I said, we'll talk a little bit about him here in a second. Moving into our XC2 class, it was Johnny Gerard, Johnny G, the New Englander on the Trail Jesters KTM. We just spoke with him about his win in that XC2 class. Mike Witkowski. Came into this round leading the points with the white plate once again there. He gets second place this weekend. And I do believe that they'll be sharing the points lead going into round number three this weekend in Georgia. Because at Big Buck, Mike won it. Johnny got second. Now fast forward a week or two weeks later in the Sands of Florida. Johnny wins it. Mike gets second. So they should be tied up in points. I'm not a mathematician, but that makes sense to me. And our third place finisher in that XC2 class was Rockstar Energy Husqvarna's Craig DeLong. So no longer Coastal Racing Husqvarna, it is Rockstar Energy Husqvarna. And we'll be talking to Craig here in just a few moments to talk a little bit more about that deal and how it came to be and also about his race this past weekend. But not before we get to our FMF XC3 class, Zach Hayes. Going back to back, he gets the win once again at round number two. So he is 1-1 on the season as well in that XC3 class. He is a newcomer to the XC3 class. We've seen him in the XC2 class for the past several years. He bought himself a 125. He is out there racing, and it is going well for him so far as he takes the first two victories in 2020. Jake Froman, your second-place rider in that XC3 class, and rounding out your XC3 class podium, it is Nate Furderer, who has also been up in the mix as well. All three of those guys battled for those positions. Uh, Zach and Jake, they were next to each other in the overall. Nate was just ahead of Brady Moore, I believe is who it was. Um, 
So a lot of battles going on in that XC3 class. Jesse Ainsley, he gets a good finish this weekend, but he obviously moved up into the XC2 class. I think he got 12th overall for 6th in XC2, I want to say. Hopefully, I'm not wrong about that, but he had a good ride, impressive ride from him, learning the new bike, going from a two-stroke to that four-stroke 250F, but he is from Florida, so he had a good showing down there in Florida, but with him moving up into that XC2 class, it's left the XC3, XC3 class up for grabs, and all of these riders in here are all vying for that title, so... A lot of tight battles and a lot of swapping back and forth as we see this XC3 battle develop throughout the season. And also, mentioned it briefly earlier, Brody Johnson on that Phoenix Racing Honda. He will grab the 250A class victory as well as the top amateur rider overall with an 18th place finish is what I think it was. Uh, so awesome job for Brody. Brody's been absolutely killing it. So he went from top amateur at Big Buck to winning the pro overall at Mid East to this weekend getting top amateur in the 250A once again. So Brody has been lighting it on fire. So awesome for him as he advances through there. Jonathan Johnson, Brody's older brother, XC2 competitor. Come to find out, he had a broken rib. So he raced that Florida race through all those sand whoops for three hours with a broken rib. So uh, he's going to be healing up from that. It's tough to ride with a broken rib. I've done it before, and I'm not fast at all. So I can't imagine what it's like to actually try to go fast, and especially in a race like the Florida GNCC. So quick shout-out to Jonathan Johnson there. Both Brody and Jonathan, friends of the show, friends of the podcast. So um, it, it's cool to see them doing big things this year under that Phoenix Racing Honda tent. Also want to check in with our OG OTP riders. Forgot to do this at round number one, but some good buddies of the show. They've all been on the show numerous times. They're all close friends of mine. Starting things off with TSB945, Trevor Barrett. He is uh, racing that XE2 class once again, while all of these riders I'm about to talk about maintaining full-time jobs, all of them in the construction industry, except one, which he, uh, the point is, they both they all work a lot and still go out there and race on the weekends, but Trevor, on that Living Extreme, on the Pipe Podcast, KTM, he gets himself a 13th place finish in XE2 and 22nd overall which is an awesome ride for him. Uh, was off the bike for a while, didn't race hardly at all last year. Had some health issues going into Big Buck, but he rebounds from that, and uh, the, the goal is to, to finish and keep moving forward, and he did that, and he had a solid ride, and he's had some solid starts at the past couple rounds too, so uh, big congrats to Trevor there. Although I'm sure he's not too stoked with those results, he, uh, it's a start, and it's trending in the right direction, and no doubt that we'll see him moving up those XC2 rankings throughout the year. We also got Craig Oberholzer slash Oberdozer slash Goober Gazer. He gets third place in Open B. He is fast. He's got the speed to win that Open B class, but uh, also the conditioning or the the not the conditioning but the humidity and the heat and everything that goes into that florida race is the first hot race of the year i think i read in his thing that he just hit a wall at some point throughout the race so he settles for a third place podium position in that open b class tyler bruton and thomas caldwell big tom bad luck bruton and big tom they both have it's turning on to a, to an ongoing battle for this whole shot each week. Thomas got it at round number one with Tyler right behind him. And then at round number two, Tyler Bruton got the whole shot just in front of Thomas, who was right behind him this week. So interesting to see that battle coming out. It is, it's kind of cool that they've both been one and two off the starts two weeks in a row now. They end up finishing eighth and twelfth in that junior A B class, which is a stacked class to begin with. And then you throw in a rough and rowdy sand course, Palmetto Roots, and 13 miles of it. It turns into a crapshoot. So those guys finish eighth and twelfth. So shout out to all four of them. 
And I completely forgot to mention that our WXC riders we saw the is it Babs? I think it's Babs Yamaha, also supported by Fly and Maxis Yamaha rider of Becca Sheets. She goes back to back, makes it two in a row. A former GNCC champion. She starts off the season in 2021 with defending three-time series champion the rock star energy land mills husqvarna of taylor jones and kenzie tricker is going to be your third place rider in that wxc class which uh last i knew was mepmx ktm so if i am wrong about that i am dreadfully sorry i was not at the full gas at the first one. That's usually when I figure out everyone's new rides for the year. So, Kenzie, if that is not your sponsor for this year, I completely apologize. If it is your sponsor, go team. But uh, that is the way that your WXC class went. Was First of all, let's get a couple things out of the way with the WXC class. I read that Rachel Archer was battling up there and then got tangled up with a lapper in a whoop section where the lapper then proceeded. I guess Rachel's bike fell underneath of this lap rider's bike. So according to her, she went up, picked the bike up off of her bike so she could get going again. And she moved the bike and flipped it over the other way, which is probably something that every single one of us would do. And, uh, she said that the rider then proceeded to grab her and hit her in the helmet, like punch her in the helmet. That just sickens me, man. I, there's no, I don't, uh, it may be wrong of me to assume this, but I can only assume that it was a, a vet rider, an older rider, because that is largely what the morning class is. But even if it was a young rider, old rider, I don't care how old they are. I don't care what class they're riding. That is unacceptable to hit any person during a race and it's definitely unacceptable to hit any women's rider during a race so whoever that guy is i hope you feel tough i hope you feel like a badass that you really try to be but uh that that's why you got to take a couple steps closer to the toilet when you pee than the rest of us because if you do something like that you man that's all I'm going to say about that before I get myself in trouble. But uh, if you're a fan of the podcast, then I invite you to never listen to this podcast again because you're kind of a piece of crap. So that's how I feel about whoever punched Rachel Archer in the head. That's just There's no need for that. Um, also, Taylor Jones had bike problems on the start. So she actually started in the back of the Sportsman A-Row. And I was going through some pictures from Ken Hill Um and and looking over that and she you you couldn't start any farther back she started behind the sportsman a row which is always a big row she works her way up through the pack to battle back for second place position which is absolutely insane to come physically from behind all those sportsman a riders get in front of all of them and then pass all the way through the wxc class as well so uh that battle i think is going to be a fun one to watch this year and i think it's going to be very close as becca sheets and taylor jones battle for that wxc title but it's already starting off with fireworks as they go one two two weekends in a row so definitely one to keep an eye on going forward and speaking of ken hill I never got to thank our sponsors, so I'm going to take a moment right now to say thank you to our great friends over at Armored Graphics. You can check them out at Armored Graphics or on the web at armoredgraphics.com. They are the number one source for the highest quality and best looking graphics that you can possibly get. Once they get the site back up and running, you should be able to use promo code OTP. If you're ordering in the meantime, shoot them an email, shoot them a DM, give them a call. Let them know that you are a listener to On The Pipe Podcast. They have been with us since day one, more than two and a half years ago is how long we've been doing this podcast. So uh, they've been along for the whole entire ride. They designed our logo. They designed our shirts. They made our shirts. They have helped us out a lot, helped us out with graphics in the past. As far as our show graphics, they printed all the stickers. So if you have an OTP sticker, it came from Armored Graphics. And they also do the JGR MX and Factory Suzuki graphics. So you can see their work every single weekend on Saturday nights at Supercross. 
but uh, you can also see them at a local track near you. So thanks once again to Armor Graphics. Make sure you are checking them out and giving them a follow. And also getting into our photographers, Ray Newton. Ray races the NCHSA series. He also shoots it. He shoots the Mideast when he can, GCCs when he can. He's a 15-year-old photographer. He's got a smug mug, so you can always check his smug mug for your race photos after each event that he is at and covering. And then also, I just want to say uh, thanks to Ken Hill. Ken Hill is the GNCC series photographer. He battled some health issues, but he's back out there. Making sure that everyone has pictures at the GNCC. He's also got a smug mug. If you Google Ken Hill smug mug, I think it's actually kenhill.smugmug.com. But he gets a gajillion shots throughout the weekend. So there is most likely one of you if you have been at a GNCC. But also want to give him credit as well for taking all those pictures because... By the time you're hearing this, you've probably seen our social media post utilizing those Ken Hill pictures. So go give him a follow on the social medias and uh, check out Ray Newton and Ken Hill Smug Mugs after races. Um, Yeah, so there's our sponsors. If you would like to be a sponsor, hit us up. Let's work together. Show's growing. Grow with us. Anyway... Some of the stories from the GNCC, the Sherco machines. They got to make Shercos to the finish line. Uh, that's nothing bad against them. I just wanted to use that pun because I thought it was funny. But uh, really doing the best that they can. I mean, this is coming in at the, the biggest series at the top of the level, at the top of the food chain as far as putting both the Baylor boys on it and running those Shercos in the front row. They have been running stock machines, and I mean, that's that's really all there is to say about it. They are in the middle of developing. They are developing and tuning and really dialing in these mach- machines as they go. So some issues here and there are to be expected, and there's really no way around it as they are, like I said, developing those bikes. But the way that they are riding while they're on those bikes – watch out once they get them figured out because they are both going to be forces to be reckoned with but obviously uh grant baylor comes into the pits he the so they have stock tanks there's not an oversized tank made yet for the shirka so they have a custom fabricated piece on the tank that is made out of plastic that allows a riser for a quick fill to be put on then the risers coincidentally are made by otp og tyler bruton so if you would like a gas or a fast break riser for your gas tank to where it'll vent all built into it so you don't have to drill a hole into your brand new tank you can hit up tyler and he can hook you up with one of those but they're running those on the factory sherco machines but the adapter that connects the riser to the tanks is made out of plastic and as they found out this weekend are susceptible to hard impacts i guess grant had a pretty hard get off this weekend and it actually broke that plastic piece off of the uh off of the tank which left a giant gaping hole in the top of that tank for that sherco so obviously not what they were going for but uh grant was able to pull off to the track or pull off the track and get back to the pits where Eric Searton did the fastest gas gas tank swap I've ever seen in my life. I don't think I don't think that anybody in perfect circumstances could do it any better or any faster. I think it was under three minutes between tank off the bike, new stock tank on the bike, and they ended up having to go back and replace the fuel pump after that. But just the sheer quickness that that tank came off and the new tank came on. It blows my mind. I mean, bloody busted knuckles and everything. He dove into that thing. He got that thing changed so quick. And you got to keep in mind that he had no idea what was coming. He had no idea that he was about to be swapping a tank. So he sees Grant come from somewhere off the track, through the banner on Pro Row, straight across Pro Row, into the pits, sees the problem, diagnoses the problem, gets the parts needed, changes the tank out in less than three minutes. 
absolutely insane, absolutely very impressive. And because of the fast and quick thinking and fast working mechanic like that, he was able to get back out onto the track and save some very valuable points as he ends up, let me count here, I'm not very smart, four, oh, I'm still looking at Big Buck, let me go back, but, uh, I mean, it's stuff like that that really pays off when you're looking at these races, because every single second counts, especially the level of competition that there is right now, so every second that you can gain in a situation like that, and be able to get back out on the track at all, and save those points, is going to go such a long way, especially when you look at the fact that this is a 13-round season and every point is going to come into play. But he was able to get him back out there. Granted, they score points for the top 20. Grant Baylor scores, or uh, he ends up in the 20th position overall, 8th place in XC1. So able to get him back out there in time for him to work through the pack. He was 74th overall when they when he went back out onto the track and was able to work back up to 20th overall. So awesome job by the whole Sherco team and Eric and Grant and everybody involved in that. Uh, definitely very impressive. The other Sherco bike, the 514, older brother Stuart Baylor Jr., he had some bike problems, left his bike in the woods, grabbed an e-bike, and rode down to the pits. And uh, I don't know the full story behind that of what he was carrying, but he made his way back into the pits. Come to find out that the problem with his machine, and there's no way to really tell how it was caused, but the wire for the radiator cooling fan was shorting out on something or arcing out on something. And rather than blowing a fuse, it just kept pulling power out of it into wherever it was arcing out until it eventually melted the battery. So normally something like that should pop the fuse and it would cut off power going to that wire. For whatever reason, it did not. And it kept putting power through that wire until the battery literally melted inside of the bike and almost caught fire. So both of those things are not Sherco issues. Both of those things do not come down to reliabilities of Sherco machines. Both of those things come down to one-off items that they're working with and experimenting with and, and helping develop. So still way too early for the, the negative Sherco talk. I mean, they've proved that these bikes are able to win races. Stuart Baylor says several times, during his interview during the broadcast that he was the fastest bike on the track and he was reeling in Caleb Russell and uh they went two three at the Sumter National Enduro they went four and six at Big Buck uh four and five four and six something like that I know Stu got fourth uh, so they've proven these bikes have what it takes but they're still developing developing them they're still going over all the pieces and putting it all together. And when Stu spoke with us on All the Pipe Podcast, he, I mean, he was talking about things all the way down to changing the brake pedals. So they're developing those bikes. No doubt in my mind, they're going to get those dialed in. And they, like I said, will be forces to be reckoned with. Also want to go over Andrew DeLong, the big brother of Craig DeLong, on a Phoenix Racing Honda. He was running great as well. But for the second race in a row, we see him in the pits changing out a rear brake system. So not sure what happened there. Not sure what went on with that. But for the second week in a row, they replaced a full rear brake system. This week, they did it a little bit quicker. Got Andrew on the track a lot faster. And Andrew was able to work his way back up into fifth place in the XC2, or XC1 class and eighth place overall. So very valuable time saved and very valuable points earned by Andrew DeLong. So he's been running really good. I think if he uh, can catch a break and, and get a good start, and I think that it's not a stretch to see him on some podiums throughout the season. And then uh, also XC1 competitor, we mentioned him earlier, Todd Kellett. He looks young. I, I couldn't find an age for him, but I, I saw his Instagram, and he looks young. He came over. He was on a Yamaha. He is from the U.K., as mentioned, his first GNCC ever. He goes 6th in XC1, 10th place overall, which is absolutely awesome results, especially coming in for Florida being your first one. He races the French CFS Series, which is the... 
champion de Frances des Sables. Yep, I, uh, I, I don't know French, so it's something like that, but it's the French CFS, and uh, it does really well over there. He has a Yamaha ride, so he came and joined us at the Florida GNCC, and sounds like he had a good day, but as we mentioned, Andrew DeLong, your fifth place finisher in that XC1 class, and then Todd Kellett grabbing sixth place in that XC1 class. We're going to move things over to our fourth place finisher in that XC1 class. And head to the phone now with our next guest, Jordan Ashburn with the Babbitts Online Monster Energy Kawasaki. Jordan, how's everything going today? Man, it's going good. Just uh, coming back to life from the from the brutal Florida GNCC. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's a race that I think everyone is glad to have in the rear view. Definitely is. I mean, it's never. I don't think it's one anybody looks forward to. It's like it's one you just got to get through and uh, try to try to do the best you can and, and go from that. Going straight to Georgia, it's tough. So, yeah, yeah. That it. It is funny that the the one short week of the year comes after probably the most brutal race of the season. But um, yeah, like you said, I don't think it anybody. Does. I don't think anybody looks forward to that race. And if they do, I don't know if I would trust anything that person said. <laughs> yeah man it's just uh, it's it's hard to uh it's hard to hard to want to lock going in to just pound yourself for three hours of just miserable sand loops yeah and all, i mean there's just there was a lot that happened i mean obviously one of the big things that happened is you had that that get off at the like coming into the last lap of the race which i'm not sure if you've watched the broadcast back but they got the whole thing on camera it was pretty crazy yeah, I've seen it. Uh, the funny thing is, like, I've, I have all these people texting me and like, "Oh man, you're all right, you're all right." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm good." Like, you know, that wasn't that wasn't bad. Like, this that happens in laps, you just never see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But <laughs> it's I usually mean, not caught on camera. But no, yeah, I'm all good from it. Uh, didn't even didn't really didn't mess the bike up, me up, nothing. It was it was good. So just throwed me out of rhythm a little bit. Uh, any, anytime you hit the ground, it takes a little bit to. Seems like it just throws your, I don't know, it just throws you off. Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's hard to get, like, back in a rhythm. Every time I crash like that, which is a lot, uh, I crash a lot. <laughs> but I always, like, for the next probably, like, half a mile or so, it's like trying to get my bearings back and, and get used to riding again. It's weird. Yeah, once you come off the bike, it's like you get back on, and then, you're, then it's like, whoa. This, this is weird <laughs> yeah and for me i never realized like how tired i am until i have to use my strength to like run back to my bike and then pick it up and then get going again and then i start huffing and puffing like dang exactly took so a lot like, out of me the next couple of corners after i get back on the bike i'm like oh my gosh i'm actually i'm dying i didn't realize how bad <laughs> i was dying now now i really can't breathe like there's no everything's just like adrenaline shoots up you know and everything yeah yeah, but glad to hear you're all right. I also give you a perfect tan on the dismount. I think you were standing up already by the time anyone even realized you crashed, so good tuck and roll back to the feet. Yeah, um, got to work on crashing, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, speaking of the bike, this is your second year with that the Team Green Babbitts Online Monster Energy Kawasaki. Uh, it's a mouthful to say, but last year it was kind of – the Kawasaki's aren't new to you by any means, but kind of new to you in this stage. And you guys were going through the growing pains of, of getting back used to the bikes and everything and getting your setups dialed in for you. Your second year on the team, coming into 2020, how's your confidence with the bike and with the team going into this year as opposed to last year when it was all brand new? Yeah, last year we had a lot to learn. You know, it's uh, you always want to get, get, get things rolling and, and be right there start of the year on a new bike but it's just hard to do that i mean uh we had a lot of stuff to learn on suspension and uh it's just we get we got the bikes going good this year and it took a while last year but man it's just it, it feels great to be able to come out this year and and ride good right off the get-go and 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 have good results and uh, you know it's just confidence in the bikes everything and once you can once you can trust the bike then you can 
worry about everything else and kind of let it fly. Yeah, and just like you said, putting in good results this year, and it was kind of all trending in the right direction. Uh, at the end of last year, I'm no Mason Dixon, man. I was I was gutted. You were out in front, led the majority of that race. But uh, come back out this season, I mean, running – up in the front second third like running all up all up front in both of the first two rounds so now that you've proven that you can be up front does that make you even hungrier for a podium going into georgia after a short week it does man and uh you know it's just like i'm, I'm always a pretty i'm always a good strong starter and i'm always up there at the beginning and i, I know i have to work i have to work on so it's just it's little mistakes you know that, that just add up like that crash being one of them last weekend it just just throwed me off a little bit. We was, we was all in a battle, me, Ricky, and Josh, and I, I crashed there and uh, lost lost them. So, I mean, it's just, it's tough. It's really tough to put it all together and, and just have a good race. I mean. Yeah, I mean, speaking of you three, I mean, there was a large period of time where you could just about throw a net over you and Ricky, especially. You guys were battling back and forth for a majority of that race, really not leaving each other's sights and, it was pretty cool because on the live broadcast, you got to see like the drone directly up overhead when uh, Ricky was trying to chase you down and, and you were still making the moves and staying out in front. I mean, kind of walk us through that battle. What is it like when you're down in the sands of Florida, you know it's a tough race from the get-go, and then not only that, you know that you have a battle on your hands for the entire time, essentially. Yeah, it's definitely tough. Uh, I know... Me and Ricky both were pushing really hard, and uh, it, it's just in the sand, especially. You know, you have to ride so much looser, and we're both just kind of hanging it out. And he was a little faster than me in a couple sections, and I think I had him in a few. And it, we were just back and forth, and uh, man, it was fun. It, it was it was actually good racing. I think that it's it's always nice to uh, it's nice to have, nice to have that because you know when you get out by yourself, sometimes you get stuck. And it's hard to keep pushing, but when you're battling with guys, it's 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 fun to keep racing. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, it was it was like a, a constant pressure throughout that entire thing. But I yeah, mean, and not to mention, I mean, like the whole time me and Ricky were together, I think I think it was I don't even know what laps it was, but it was from the middle part toward till I crashed, and then but the whole time, like when we go through the fields or the sand sections or whatever, where the track would relap on itself like strain was right there too like he was always right there like waiting for just just slowly creeping up and you know it's just uh those guys are both riding really good so yeah but i mean so are you like you said you've been running up there top three running in second so i mean it's awesome to see the level of everyone pushing each other this year but i've heard a lot about the track in florida this year I, at the last second, decided not to go, so I didn't get to see the track firsthand. Did mm -hmm. you think that the, the Florida track this year was different in years past as far as uh, not being no smooth smoother lines opening up on the edges? or I mean, did you see any difference in the track? I don't know if I've seen more difference in the track or if I was just more prepared for it this year. Because, I mean, I did feel like I liked the track better than – any other year I raced it but I felt like I really had a good setup this year and I was comfortable on the bike so uh, I think the track was laid out well because the first three three and a half miles was all like really gnarly sand whoops and then you had a bike only section that was kind of like had a lot of roots and palmettos and uh, like it was kind of more black dirt and uh, you come back around and uh got back in the whoops again it kind of went back and forth between that and then towards the end it was all fields and uh kind of faster flowy stuff so it was a good mix and it was kind of to me it was like you come around to that first part of the sand whoops to start to lap over and you're like okay i just gotta make it through this section and just kind of breathe a little bit and then you can it, it, it did i don't know i think i kind of like the layout this year and uh, i think maybe it was a little better than years past Dang, I mean that was that was like a, a perfect answer for it in the fact that uh, you being more prepared for it, and that probably goes yeah. a lot along with having a full year under your belt with uh, with that Babbitt's online team over there. But um, as far as 
becoming prepared and and being ready to go racing you're one of the guys we don't typically see like the whole training program documented out and, and posting all the time and, and videos coming out what do you do for training like what 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 do you do throughout the year to stay on top of everything and to train like what's a typical week like preparing for a race yeah i'm not i don't know i don't i've never been real flashy posting everything up and stuff but you know, i definitely work hard and i do pretty much i do everything on my own so it's all it's all solo and uh you know when i do get to to do stuff i do a lot of cycling and uh you know but in the background and it's just a big mix of everything i mean nothing in particular <laughs> Gotcha. So just nose to the grindstone and and keeping yourself motivated, but um, pretty much. And also, got to, got to factor in the KDX rides. It seems like I see a lot of those adventures you know, out yeah, there. For, for off season, yeah, it's just man. I love to trail ride. I love to adventure ride. I love to just. I love taking dirt bikes where they don't belong. I mean, that's kind of outside of GNCC. I love hard enduro, so I love getting out. I've raced Battle of the Goats and, you know, TKO numerous times. I love that kind of stuff. So it's really good training, you know. You're pushing, you've got to get good at pushing your back up stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's got to be good for you, I guess. I mean, it definitely has to be. I mean, especially when you're <laughs> jumping out of culverts and riding up waterfalls and all the stuff we see you doing. And, I mean, race Battle of the Goats is an understatement for going out there and winning the, the one that you did. Is there is there any chance to see you in any extreme or hard enduro events? I know Kawasaki they're more focused towards the the GNCCs and everything, and, and don't make a, a current two stroke. But is that something that has ever came up in discussion, or something that you would even that you would want to do? I would love to, but it's just not really in the plans right now. I'm just trying to focus on GNCC and you know just finish good there and. Uh, and keep, that's my main focus. I'm just trying to get to, to put some good results in and uh, keep the Cowies up front. Absolutely, and uh, you're doing a great job at that. And I think a podium's right around the corner with the way you've been riding. I mean, this Georgia track is it one that you you typically like, or um, are, are you? I mean, you got to be excited to get back up into the clay. <laughs> yeah, I am for sure. I mean, typically, like I don't like South Carolina. I don't like Big Buck or Florida so I mean I'm I'm pretty happy with the way things are going right now and I definitely want to be on the podium and I'm looking forward to this weekend I mean I think it's definitely it's going to be a good track I've, I've always kind of liked the place um it's usually pretty redded out and pretty rough so I, I, it'll be a pretty good race weekend yeah absolutely and also George always has that that really tight section too which um I'm a fan of the tight stuff because then you don't go as fast when you hit trees <laughs> for me <laughs> um but yeah, it does it makes it super tough passing people though that's for sure yeah yeah no doubt about that but man i, I appreciate you taking the time out and talking with me tonight and and kind of giving us some more insight into the way that your season is going and look forward to seeing you this weekend and good luck through the rest of your season and, and once again thanks for chatting with us uh thanks see ya bye bye so there was Kawasaki's Jordan Ashburn, been right on the edge of that podium so far this year. Um, as I mentioned before as well, the Mason Dixon GNCC, he led 80% of that race. That was the race with all the dust and a lot of bikes ended up breaking down. Unfortunately, he was one of them. But if you have not yet met Jordan and you've never talked to him, I highly encourage you, go find that Kawasaki rig, go shake his hand, go talk to him. You can't find guys any nicer than jordan ashburn he's he's such a stand-up guy and uh just an all-around good person him and his wife both so uh if you haven't met him yet go down there shake a hand make a friend uh it's really cool to be able to catch up with jordan and i really appreciate him taking the time out to speak with us we're gonna move things along into our final guest of the evening and i saved him for last because it was a really interesting conversation and a really interesting talk about Craig DeLong, which Craig DeLong, the big news over the past week was that he makes the move from Coastal Racing Husqvarna to Rockstar Energy Husqvarna to fill in with both Tra- or Thad, I was 
tried to in or mix Trevor and Thad, and that came into Chad. But Chad Duvall is Thad Duvall's dad, and Thad Duvall and Trevor Bollinger are both out with knee injuries. So Husky and Rockstar made the decision to put Craig DeLong on a factory machine, which Craig will still be competing in the XC2 Series this year. Craig's been one of them guys that we've talked about since this show started. He's been one of those guys that's been at the front of the XC2 pack since this show started, and he was obviously one of the favorites coming into this season to win the XC2 Championship. He comes home with two third-place finishes at Big Buck and at Wild Boar, but he's right there on the edge, and now he's got a whole team behind him. He can make the changes that he wants to make, and he's got that team behind him for the confidence and the support, which he'll kind of get into here in a moment. But um, it was very nice to be able to catch up with Craig and very nice to be able to talk with him. And I hope that you guys enjoy this interview with Craig because also another stand-up guy. I mean, talk about nose of the grindstone and going after it. That is exactly what Craig DeLong does. He is focused. He is ready. And I think that we'll be seeing big things from him going forward as well. So without further delay, we're going to be talking with the brand new Rockstar Energy Husk Varna Rider XC2 competitor Craig DeLong. Craig, how's everything going today? Uh, it's going good, man. Just uh, trying to recuperate for the weekend and uh, trying to heal up as fast as I can because we got a race here in a couple of days. Yeah, so, I mean, that's not that's not a typical GNCC weekend. I mean, I know there's a lot of stuff going on throughout the year, but how hard is it going back-to-back weekends like this without any time in between, especially your situation, switching over with a new team? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely makes things tough. I mean, on a normal race weekend, you know, in the middle of the year, it's not really a big deal, but Florida's the toughest race all year. And then, so going from that into a race, you know, a week later, is, it's very difficult. And then um, my situation is, you know, I don't have a lot of time on new suspension, pretty much a new bike. So no, the more time that I could get would be, would be really good. But, um, yeah, my body's just not <laughs> feeling ready to ride yet. So uh, I just kind of got to play it by ear. Well, I mean, we mentioned that, and I mentioned that in the intro here. But, I mean, that is – the, the big news lately is that you are making the move over to the Rockstar Energy Husqvarna rig, which you've been riding a Husky for several years now. So, I mean, first and foremost, congratulations on, on getting that ride. That's that's awesome. But did you did you physically switch bikes? Like, are you on a completely different bike, or did you kind of take your your settings and, how, and your bikes over with you to the rig? Like, how did that whole switch happen? Yeah, it was... Um... It's pretty much, I don't want to say it's a new bike because I had good support from Husky when I was on Coastal and I was getting, um, like, factory motors anyways. But, um, like, being on their team, like, obviously I get their suspension now and, like, the full package and um, maybe some better parts. I'm not really sure. But, um, yeah, just a new bike. I mean, new, like, a different frame, you know, new handlebars and stuff like that. Like, I got to practice with, the stuff for a week before but um you know a new bike is a new bike and it's it kind of feels a little foreign at first and uh it took me a little bit to get used to i mean riding around the parking lot for 10 15 minutes before the race you know it doesn't really do you too good so um i mean it's no excuses though. i mean i i rode enough the week before with the suspension and stuff so i i knew it wasn't gonna do anything stupid and i had some trust in it so it just just myself getting used to a new bike where, you know, just new people to work with and just, uh, I don't know, kind of like a whole new, you know, new faces and stuff. So, um, but other than that, everything was really good. The team has been awesome so far and I, I really can't complain with, you know, working with them and Timmy and, you know, Tanner, my mechanic and, uh, you know, Bauer and, uh, Blue and Leon, the suspension guy, like they everyone's been really good whatever I need, um, you know, they're there for me and they, they get it to me as quick as possible. And, you know, I can't ask for any more than that. 
Yeah, man. And you mentioned being on the coastal racing team. Uh, obviously, you've been over there with Barry and them for years now. And that coastal Husky team, that's one of the premier, like, non non quote unquote factory teams but like you said it's a lot of support coming from husky so you had a big support system around you already what's the difference in and i know you haven't had much time with them first race and everything but what's the difference mainly between switching from uh one of the satellite teams to the full-blown factory deal like what's the biggest difference you would say in having that team behind you um I would say not much of a difference. I mean, um, like like you said, Coastal is, you know, they're, for, for being like a, I want to say not really a privateer team, but for a privately funded team, you know, like just factory supported there. Very, uh, very good. Um, you know, great support with sponsors and anything you need is, it's really, really good team. But, um, you know, the factory team is just, it's factory. I mean, you you deal right with the, the you know the the right people, and you know whatever you need, they get it done. And it's um, yeah, it's, it's not much of a difference, but just little things here and there that that kind of set like sets them apart from everybody else. Like just you know, if I need suspension change, you know, they're overnight me suspension or you know, tires, I mean, they're whatever I need there, you know, no questions asked, just like, yeah, we got it, like, here you go, and, um, that's just like, I don't know, I'm not talking about on coast or anything like that, but it's like, just little things here and there that it just sets them apart, and it's, um, I don't know, I want to say, like, a little bit of confidence, too, you know, because, like, you're on a, you know, a factory team, it's, it's just cool, because, that's what we all dream of we, when we start riding, you know, like, oh, I want to be a factory, you know, factory racer someday. So, um, just a cool little, um, uh, confidence thing. So, um, but no, not much of a change. I mean, you know, with just different people and that's the biggest thing is just the different people. But I mean, I, not much of a change really, to be honest with you. Gotcha. I mean, it's cool to see that coastal team having, so much support and everything to make it not as big of a transition moving into the the factory setup. But like you said, it it still is a big change. It it still is that, that confidence of having that team behind you. And as you mentioned, getting parts and stuff quicker, but Husky, we typically see that rockstar rig with two riders. Unfortunately, both of the riders are out right now. You step in now it's all eyes on you. We're going after uh, Craig DeLong is our guy. We're putting him out there on the bike. Do you, I mean, you were obviously one of the championship contenders coming into this season and really the the favorite to win this XC2 championship. You came off two wins to end out the season last year. Do you feel any added pressure now ch- stepping up to that Rockstar team or is it still the same focus as it was back in January coming into 2020? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing as, you know, all winter long is what I've been, you know, looking forward to. And that's been the goal is, you know, to win races and to, you know, eventually get to that championship at the end of the year. So, um, goal is still the same. I mean, no really added pressure. I mean, this weekend I would say I was a little bit under some pressure just myself, you know, just like you said, being the only guy underneath the tent, you know, obviously bad news, you know, Thad and Trevor out with, with both knee injuries and stuff like that. And it's, you know, I would really like to have them guys there, you know, with me under there, but, um, it's just, you know, not how it's working out. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess in, in my case, it is better for me because it's more attention and kind of, you know, helping me get sorted out quicker, I would say, you know, cause it's, you know, more attention towards me. So, um, but yeah, no, like, Timmy and, you know, Tanner and them, they're all really good. Like, they're not putting pressure on me, like, hey, you gotta go out there and win. And, like, you know, they're, they've all been really good so far. And, and, uh, you know, I can't pass for anything more. Awesome. I mean, that, that's really good to hear. And no doubt, as you guys work together and get that bike even better, you're gonna solidify yourself even more in that XC2 class going forward. And looking forward to seeing that. But going into this past weekend, 
I mean, the sands of Florida, there's no other race that we race that's like it. It is probably the roughest and hardest track of the year. It's the first time everyone's really putting in race time in the heat down there and in the humidity. Um, obviously, it doesn't start your day off well when you don't get a good start. This past weekend, not the best start in the world, but you picked through the pack. I think you were sixth place going through scoring on the first lap and then slowly just uh, ticked away and, and made your way up through the pack. What's it like to come from the back like that in such a, a tough environment that you already know is going to be grueling at the beginning of the race? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely not something you want to see. Like, you know, when I'm in the back of the pack, and you know, in, in the open area, you can see, you know, Witowski out front and, you know, him, you know, first or second, you know, it's like he's getting away and I'm back and, you know, like, I think like maybe 15th, you know, in the beginning, like on the beginning of the first lap. So mm -hmm. definitely got to fight your way through. And it's like, I don't want to say it's like a panic situation, but it's like you're, you're pushing harder than you want to, especially in the deep and rough sand, you know, like you want to be up front and kind of, you know, not cruising, but not fighting through the pack either. So, um, you know, I kind of dug myself a little bit of hole there in the beginning, in the beginning and, had to make a bunch of passes early and you know i got in the sixth there at the end of the first lap and made a couple more passes and by the end of the second lap i could see the leaders and i was kind of you know in fourth place and i could you know maybe 10 seconds behind third and um you know i was pretty comfortable but i was still pushing hard and i want to you know and um yeah i had to pit and then had to play a little bit more catch up to kind of bridge that gap again and uh, it just played catch up a little too much in the beginning, and I think I kind of depleted myself more than I wanted to, and kind of hurt me there at the end. I think just um, having that final last push, I kind of just physically, you know, just put it all out there. I guess at the end, and just wasn't enough to, you know, to bring it in because me and Mike were battling on the last lap. We went back and forth a couple times. And, I would get by him and, you know, he'd make an effort and get back by me and I would do the same thing to him. And, you know, three miles ago, I, I was around him in second and um, he put in a good charge through a section and got back by me and I tried to stay with him and I just kind of fell apart physically and, uh, you know, he, he beat me fair and square and, and uh, yeah, so it was definitely a, not an easy day for sure, just coming from the back of the pack and, not much of a rest, you know, you're, I was always charging and trying to catch back up. So, um, yeah, better start would be, would be nice. Well, this is going to be a really stupid question, but I will never know what it's like to pass any XC2 riders, let alone 11 of them in one lap. When it comes off to the beginning like that, I mean, guys know that you're constantly on the podium. You're battling up front, battling for wins. When you get a bad start like that, does anybody like as you're working your way up through there? Do they realize that you're on, you're giving them pressure, and that you might be a little bit faster than them, and kind of give you space to get by, or is it still you got to earn every single pass to get through there? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's about fifty-fifty. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I will say that when I did get the bad start this weekend, I wasn't very happy. So I was kind of, you know, I was doing whatever I could to get by. I mean, I wasn't being super aggressive, like, you know, bang into anybody, but, you know, if I came into a tight turn and I was, you know, coming in hot, I was yelling at them or, you know, revving the bike, making sure they knew I was there and, you know, hopefully they look over their shoulder and realize, you know, like, hey, like, this guy's got some speed coming, you know, maybe they'll, they'll pull over, but for the most case, I was able to squeak around a couple guys, you know, down the whoops, I was a little just probably riding just, I want to say kind of stupid, but just like blitzing the whoops and just going for it, you know, because you got to get to the front as quick as you can. And, and um, you know, it, it gets a little squirrely sometimes, you know. Um, there's some guys out there, they just, they go going for it, but they're, you know, they get a little squirrely sometimes. So it gets a little hairy. But, um, no, most people are pretty good. There's a couple guys that they want to, they really want to race you for everything they got. And it's like, you know, you don't want to be rude, like, hey, man, like, sometimes I lap you, like, you should just pull over, but, um, you know, they're out there racing, too, so you can't really be too, uh, 
Uh, you can't really be too mean to them. So, um, but I mean, it, it's tough. Some races are easier than others, but um, I mean, it's the same for everybody. Whoever gets a bad start, I mean, they've got to fight through the pack too. So, um, it's all about where you put yourself. And I, I didn't put myself in a good position, so it's no one to blame but myself. You know, man. Well, two things. First of all, you, you, you kind of. I mean, you still rode incredibly well. You you still came back from the back of the pack. You still an, ended up on the podium, getting uh, those points. And I mean, we still got eleven races left, so uh, still an awesome ride. Granted, like you said, start wasn't what you wanted, but you made the most of it for sure. Um, but as you you mentioned there, it's kind of that's that that was the reason for my question is you are lapping some of those guys in, in the race, starting from the same row as them. So that's why I was kind of. Curious as to how they treated it uh, with you coming up behind them and, and revving at them and them realizing that uh, you didn't get the best start. So it's interesting to see that perspective and, and see what it's like for that. But going back to it, as we mentioned, Florida is kind of a one-off race. There's not another race like it. Looking at the lap times, you actually put down some of the fastest lap times of the entire class, and it's actually once you, you broke away and you were – swapping back and forth with second and third and, and pushing up towards the front. Do you typically look forward to Florida? Are you, are you good in the sand? Are you confident going into it? Or is it one of those rounds that you approach like, all right, let's just get this one out of the way? Um, I mean, for sure, I, you know, you, I came in pretty confident. I've been staying down here for the last two months and, you know, riding the sand every day. So I expected to be – you know, strong, you know, I, I really wanted to, you know, cause I didn't have a great ride at big, but not a great, a bad ride, but you know, I wanted to do better at big buck and, um, you know, I wanted a little bit of redemption. And, uh, so I was coming in like, you know, really wanting to change that around and, and, um, yeah, just kind of, I don't know, just, uh, not disappointed with my ride, just two months down here in the sand every day, you know, you expect to do a little better. So, um, but yeah, it's, I'm happy to get through it. You know, Florida's a brutal race and, you know, anytime you can get on the podium it is, it's good. So, um, yeah, I can't really complain too much, but, um, you know, like last year, like I missed the first three races with an injury. So right now I'm, I'm happy to be scoring points and, you know, being there on the podium. So, and when we, we get back up home and, you know, I can, be at my house and sleep in my own bed and stuff like that. I'll be a, a little more, you know, not comfortable, but you know, home is home. So, uh, you know, you can't argue with that. Yeah. Kind of back in your own element there. So I'll definitely see what you mean with that, but you mentioned it just a second ago and, uh, I don't want to keep you too long here, but you were mentioning swapping back and forth on that last lap. You actually came into the white flag lap in second, but for three hours long, you and Mike pretty much never lost each other's sight throughout that entire race. And um, I mean, your first win came back in 2016 at the Penton. Mike was on the podium there, shared the podiums with you um, before in the past. So, I mean, you guys are no strangers to racing each other. Kind of walk us through that last lap. I know you said that um, getting worn out and stuff from the beginning, but walk us through that last lap as to what it took to to really charge hard and, and battle knowing that it was the last half an hour of a three-hour race yeah i mean it was it was tough i mean um it's never easy battling someone on the last lap because they're you know they're wanting the same thing too so you know they're not willing to quit so um it was definitely tough you know i was i was obviously I think you said second going in the last lap and um you know it's just one of those things like I make a mistake and you know choose a bad line and he'll choose one line and you know I was going for the smoother line where he just pounded through the rough line and got by me and you know, I'd just follow him and you know it was one of those things like it's a little bit easier to follow sometimes so like you know he was probably doing the same thing off me like I get by him and he was pacing off me and kind of saving some energy and you know, when he was feeling good, he'd probably go by me. And, you know, I was doing the same thing to him. You know, I'd get in behind him, follow him, pace him, and ride some different lines, see what was good. And, you know, I had some spots picked out in my head that I, I thought I could make a pass, and, and I did. 
and uh, you know he probably had the same thing, you know. So it it worked out, but just like the intensity, like it felt like it doubled and tripled there in the last couple of miles. It was like we were both going for it, and you know we were really really close. We were just um, like I said, going for it. So um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, if it wasn't so physically demanding, I, I probably would have had more fun during <laughs> during the race on the last lap, but. It was one of those things that was like, like you're just dying, you know, you're just physically done and you're just like, man, I just want to be over, like want to be over and, you know, just laying down, but you're just, you can't because you're not, you're not done yet. So, but, um, it was fun. I mean, anytime you can battle someone at the end is, is a good time. So, um, yeah. Well, good deal. Well, Craig, I mean, you start the season off. Uh, two third places in XE2, two top tens overall. So strong riding. Looking forward to seeing how the the rest of the season go. And once again, I, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me here. Um, but no doubt, man, I I definitely look forward to to seeing you progressing and and battling for wins and stuff throughout the season. And I'm excited to see once you get everything tuned in and, and dialed in with the new team to to see really how well you can do uh, going forward in 2020. But I know you mentioned the team and everything before. Is there anybody else you'd like to say thank you to? Uh, yeah, like the whole Coastal team for, you know, all their support in the last couple of years. And, you know, I can't can't appreciate their help and, and guidance, you know. For, I was Riders Pro, you know, deal, like, was with them. They brought me up through, you know, pretty much my whole career so far. And, um, you know, I can't thank them enough through obviously switching teams. And, you know, we all had deals signed and sponsors and stuff like that. And it's never easy, you know, making a switch halfway, th- you know, the beginning of the season. So um, just appreciate all that, you know, with them dealing with that. And and uh, obviously the whole Rockstar Husky team and Demi and, and Tanner and Bauer and, you know, everybody over there for, you know, making my switch really easy too. So, um yeah, so I, you know, I got a lot of sponsors like X Brand and Carry Resources, and uh, you know, some other people that helped me out that have, you know, been there from the beginning. So um, I can't thank them enough. And yeah, so looking to turn it around here and start clicking off some wins. So I'm uh, looking forward to it. Well, good deal. We got a short week and ready to redeem yourself in, in just a few days as we go back to Georgia this weekend. Craig, once again, congratulations on the new ride. Congratulations on on starting off strong so far this year. And uh, good luck as we move in through the rest of the season. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. So there you have it. A little peek into the brain of Craig DeLong and the um, changes that has happened over the past couple weeks and where he is at now and where he expects and plans to be. So, like I said before the interview, no doubt we're going to see big things out of him, but it's going to come down to the wire with this XC2 class. I mean, between Johnny Gerrard, Mike Wachowski, Jonathan Johnson, Craig DeLong, uh, Liam Draper, looking to see him catch his stride, Lincoln Snodgrass, there's so, excuse me, there's so many of those XC2 competitors, and uh, the top three in Craig DeLong, Mike Wachowski, and Johnny Gerrard have all solidified themselves that any single one of them could take home the championship. Jonathan, we saw him just off the podium in round one. We got that ribbon injury. So, I mean, they're all in the mix, and they can go any way. So, we're going into round number three this weekend. The points are all tied up. But I think Craig Long is, is hungry for one, and I did see him come on a good ride this weekend. He's got a little bit more seat time on bike which granted it's the same brand but as you heard it mentioned new suspension new frame new team so I mean, there's some adapting and some things going on there so looking forward to this weekend but once again thank you as always for listening i hope you enjoyed the show i hope you enjoy the interviews that we bring to you and i hope you can share these posts tell a friend about the show share this with them looking to grow this thing to really shine more light on off-road riders. That was the main focus is just 
just giving another platform for riders to be able to represent themselves, represent their sponsors, and just get in front of more people on more days of the week than besides just Sunday. So thank you all for supporting the podcast so far. We will see you this weekend in Georgia where I will be on the microphone announcing at the GNCC. Super pumped about that. You'll be hearing me throughout the pits. Looking forward to it. See you this weekend. Bye.